Hey everybody, I'm Bobby Wills, and we're hanging out at CRS here uh, today, promoting our new single, Never Didn't Love You, and uh, looking forward to spending some time in this nice, cold, frigid Nashville weather, <laughs> which makes perfect sense, because it means that the Canadians have been welcomed with open arms. That's what exactly. I think that's, that's that means. That's why we did this. Yeah. <laughs> we left snow on the ground, so that's you right. wouldn't feel Absolutely. too far away from home. The, so you mentioned the new single for the U.S. market, Never Didn't Love You, and the very first time I listened to it, I got about toward the end, and... And I thought, apology song, breakup song, Oh, both? yeah, both. Um, it's funny that you say that. I always laugh because not everybody realizes that women and men don't communicate the same way. I think people know that. But uh, we were having that moment when we were writing, and it was, I'd had a conversation with my wife that was along those lines of, you know, you need to communicate better because I need to hear it. And I thought, well, I think I say it every day, don't I? You know, and so the boys, we were yeah. riding that morning and we were having a coffee and having that discussion. And somebody said, it's not like you never didn't love her. And the double repetitive of that, like the, the it was just the double negative and everything yeah, just me, made for the right title. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it was, and it's such a universal feeling, I think. I think that men are men and women are women. And because of that, it's very, you know, it hits home for people. So Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I just thought it was, it made that song interesting because... For a lot, in a lot of songs, they'll use the bridge to make it clear that either they've split up or they make right. it clear that they're still together. But here, you're not quite sure. No, and I think it makes that song much more interesting because it leaves something for. It's almost like a, an ink blot test, and the listener will get out of it what what they want. It tells you something about how somebody interprets the song. Yeah, that's my favorite thing about a well-written song is when you can make it your own and apply it to your life, where they don't tie everything off so that you still can imagine your life in it. I, we always, I always talk about it, it's like if you're buying a house, when you go in to look at a house, if it's someone else's house, it's hard to get interested and excited about it because it's someone else's house. But if yeah. it's your house or you can imagine your life in it, then you really want it. And I feel like songwriting is like that. I think that that's one of the things we try to do is create an opportunity for people to insert themselves into the moment. Yeah. Love it when it works. Do you have a, do you guys keep when you get rea reactions or responses from audience to the, to the song, do most people see it as the breakup song? Do most people see it as, oh no, they're still together, he's just apologizing to her? And you it's, know, all do you over, have a it's all over the shop. You know, we get a different, different feedback from different audiences all the time. People see it differently, just like you said. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not consistent at all. Yeah, that's yeah. cool, I like that. And your stuff is obviously being well received. You had the, the CCMA Rising Star yeah. in 2013. Did that award feel like validation, or did it feel like something you now have to live up to? How did you... I think there's a little bit of both of those things um, happening. You know, we've invested a lot of time and energy in what we do and believe in what we do. And so to have the industry say, hey, we like it too, was really important. Um, and it did create some pressure, but for me, it's always been about the song. So if the song's great, then I think that's all you can really worry about. Yeah, that's all you really... Yeah. Well, we don't control anything. But no. As much as we control, that would be what you can control. Yeah, cut songs and, and record songs that you believe in and that you're engaged with. And that's, I think, all you can do. Yeah. The other part that I would, thought was interesting when I read your story, so you started out as an independent artist, mm -hmm. then ended up getting signed and got mm -hmm. into, into bigger things. How do you view that phase and the importance of having been able to do it your own way first? I think the struggle um, is present in the music, and I think that's important. I think when when you've had to fight for something, and you've had to go through the ups and downs, and you've had the tough days, and then you've had some of the positives, I think that the art is what really grows thanks to that. Um, I think sometimes, as hard as those days can be, um, when you're trying to climb, and you're the indie, and you're sort of trying to get some attention and fighting through it, I think it also makes you better because you have to be better. You yeah, have to yeah. work harder. You have to outwork everybody. You have to write songs that matter. And you really have to work at that. So I feel like that's the reason we're here. So if someone said, hey, you know, what's that like? Is it worth it? I would say, yeah, you have to do it. I think it's a rite of passage to get where you are artistically. And one of the things I notice when I work with new artists and songwriters is it takes people, any creative thing, whether mm -hmm. you want to be a painter or a sculptor or a musician, it takes people a while to find out who they are as an artist absolutely and that time as an independent artist can serve as that did, 
did you see it that way too? Like you know who you are now and then you get the record deal? Absolutely. I think early on we we made the mistake a lot of people make in that we, we started out with a baseline of talent and, and what we like to do. Then we got kind of pulled on into the whole this is what you should do conversation, this is what your song should be and this is what and then we started to do that and it didn't work. And so as a consequence, we circled back, and thanks to um, my producer and my and, and co-writing friends, yeah. Mike and Walt, the, they, we were able to get back centered to just looking after the music. And incidentally, when we started to just look after the music is when we got the deal and when everything started to take yeah. off. So again, I think you find your voice, but I think you have to make some mistakes. Um, and then the 10,000 hour thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just think it's part of what it is. Some people start when they're 10, and you know, some people yeah. start later, but I think the timeline's the same. Probably, yeah. Usually, yeah. And it's almost, because you use the word mistake, um, but I don't think they're mistakes. I think they're parts of that path. They're necessary yes. phases you have to go through. Yeah. It's, it's, they're not mistakes. They're learning experiences. Yeah, you look back on it as a mistake in the sense that you know it wasn't going to work, but you didn't know then. But it also is what taught you to follow your own path and to be, uh, you know, genuine and be authentic. Yeah. And I think that's the number one thing I've learned through that journey is just to, to just do what you do, do it to the best of your ability, and, you know, that's all you can do. Yeah. Put it out there like that. But it's often you'll see when you ask experienced artists what would your advice be for new artists, they'll often go, just do your own thing and be authentic. And I think... Yep. Sure, but that's not what you. You got to find it because you had that phase of messing Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Don't you think that new artist needs to do that too? Yeah. The it's, only advice I ever give is this, and I think it's good advice. As good as you think you are today, if you keep working and you don't give up, you'll be better tomorrow. Yeah. And then if you do that again tomorrow, you'll be better on Friday. You know. Yeah. And I think that if you just stay with it and and take the bumps along the way and find your voice, <laughs> you can do it. I think most people, what separates success and, and failure in this business or however you want to term that is just that how long you're willing to fight yeah I think sometimes and often what I think is what are you willing to give up for it yeah how bad do you want yeah. it and what are you willing to give up for, for sure it? for sure do you feel that there have had to have been sacrifices yeah there's been a lot of sacrifices um, how I'm, do you frame those in your life now You know, it, it, it's it's always a balancing act to try to look at careers and and those measurements, and also look at your quality of life and your time with your family and stuff. So for me, um, the effort to date has been worthwhile, and we're just really conscious about honoring the family and making sure that we have those times. It's tough. It's really tough. You yeah, know, and sometimes, it, and as things get going and you're really excited about that it actually gets tougher on the other side so it's a balance but I think you know who's it, it'd probably be better to ask my wife this question than me because I think they they have given up far more than I have they've supported me through the travel yeah. you know through the you know the, the it's not an easy way to make a living all those things and they've just been there so yeah and I think it's important to have that person there probably oh I wouldn't no way I'm here today without the the my family um, for a myriad of different reasons, um, but mostly just those tough days when you get home and you hang in your head, and you have that person that goes, "You're okay. You're okay. Just as you are. Yeah. You're okay." <laughs> the one of the things that I saw on your on the website that really caught my attention was the Respect for Human Rights Project. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge advocate for human rights and. It just made me really happy to, to see that because I often don't, you know, that's not what I was expecting to find on the right. artist website. Here's this, you know, advocacy right. for human rights. Talk a little bit about why it was important for you to set up that project, get involved with that, fight for. You know, the 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 thing with the human rights organization in Winnipeg with the museum is that they um, their biggest focus is on education, and when you look at what's going on in our world and some of the really tough things and the human rights issues in general, so much of it is in, around ed in and around education. So you have these very poor cultures that are, that are uneducated and not, you know, they're very easily influenced. And, that, and that's sort of where they're coming from. So when we read the bio, we understood what their intentions were and that they were starting from a baseline of education and saying the best way forward is to educate the children, make them understand what their rights are, make them understand what's okay and what's not okay, and break some of those barriers down. I think you can change the world. 
Definitely. I think you can. But I think it starts with education, and I think it starts with our youth. And um, that's what they're doing. So when we, w- when we approached them and they approached us, it was one of those really sort of serendipitous moments where they were looking for someone and we wanted to be involved and it just it collated and they needed a Canadian side for, for the museum along with the, the um, now I can't think of the name, the school here. What am I thinking of? My apologies. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll edit the Trojans. <laughs> My apologies. Um, with um, uh, I'm trying to think of the university. Why is it not in my mind? University of Southern California, USC. There it is. USC, the Shoah Foundation, which is oh, to yeah, do yeah. with their they're connected. So that's the U.S. side. When that all came together, and their whole premise is to educate and monitor and watch out for. Um, human rights, it was like, this is a no-brainer. This is yeah. easy. And you look at everything that's going on in the world, and so much of it is preventable. Yes. So much of it's preventable. But it starts with the desire to prevent it, and it starts with an education base. So that's what they do, and that's why we love it. This question might be tough to really phrase an answer to, but what do you think is it that stops people from seeing it as completely obvious that there should be equal rights, there should be human rights, they should be respected for everybody. Because you mentioned, you know, poorer cultures lack the the education. They simply aren't told what their rights are. Right. What's our excuse? I you think know, it's we have this information. What is it that stops people in developing country or developed countries from mm-hmm. thinking that is completely obvious? Why is not everybody involved with this? I think it's just fear. I think people are too. Or people are motivated by what could go wrong, instead of what could go right. Yeah. And so I think as a culture we need to step back and say, this just put a stand down and say this is it. This isn't okay, and we're going to stop it, and we're going to make noise about it, and we're going to stand up for it. Um, but fear drives so many of those decisions. It's like I'm scared of what the reprisal will be if I stand up. If I say this isn't okay, what does that happen to my job? Well, yeah. How does it affect uh, how I'm viewed by popular media as a celebrity if I say yes or no? Yeah. And I think so. I think it's fear number one. Yeah, probably right. Yeah. yeah. And then um, let's end on a slightly lighter note. Okay. <laughs> Which songs would you put on the soundtrack to your life? Oh wow, that's a really great question. I would have. Um, Cuts Like a Knife, Brian Adams would be oh, on there. Man, yes. Um, I would have um, uh, <laughs> Superman by R.E.M., which is like, I feel like Superman. Um, and uh, I would have a lot of Keith Whitley on there, because I just love Keith Whitley. And I'd have The River on there, the Garth Brooks song, I think. So if I had to pick other songs, those are, that's a host of them that I would have. That's the ones. All right, that's a very, very good collection. I like <laughs> it. I want to hear that, uh, that soundtrack. Thank you so much. Thank you time. so much for having me. Appreciate it. Okay.